Rachel, because I saw her sitting in the audience being so excited looking at you in person. So tell us who this guy is and why he's excited. Um, this guy's name is Kyle Hill. He ran Mythbusters to Search, which is one of my um, favorite shows, and he also has his own YouTube channel called Because Science. <laughs> it's just really exciting. <laughs> that was awesome. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, that's the best introduction I've ever gotten. Uh, hey, all right. So, hi. I'm not gonna use this microphone. This is gonna be the captain's microphone. What do those readouts even mean? No one knows. So, they're just they're just metal lights. Let's yeah. start the timer. All right. So, uh, hello. How is everyone doing so far? How's your con so far? Pretty good. Great. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Thank you to Starbase Indy for bringing me out. Uh, these smaller cons, I'd argue, are the better cons because we can actually talk to each other and be nerdy in person rather than going to San Diego and trying to just avoid human contact altogether. Um, so my name is Kyle Hill. I uh, talk about science on TV and the internet, um, as my wonderful introduction said, I'm currently the science editor at a website called Nerdist, where I do all of the science and stuff, I make their videos, do some articles, and I make a show um, called Because Science. And that's, and that's, and that's pretty much the reason uh, why I'm here today. Um, because I'm very lucky to be able to call myself a professional nerd. All I do, and I, I know, I know I'm very lucky, like I said, but I could just spend all day thinking about questions like, how does cat dog poop? And could Wolverine get a tattoo? I know, right? I, I go into an office nine to five and I think about these questions. And over the last few years, I've spent uh, my time trying to carve out a niche of what we were just kind of talking about on stage here, um, the intersection of science and popular culture, because I feel that <coughs> using our love of all things nerdy and sciencey, there is room for education and interest and an extension of fascination from there. Um, and it's a, using pop culture is a good way to explain complicated topics, because we're already interested in these complicated fictions. Um, and science is complicated. So I'm here today to do just that. I'm going to dig into some of the secret science, as I call it, as Star Wars. Of Star Wars is a little bit of a palate cleanser from all of the Star Trek stuff. I figured that would be fun. Um, there will be time at the end for questions and answers. If you have any questions for me about anything or anything that I say or anything that I claim and that I'm wrong, prove me wrong later at the end when I'm done and I will call on you. If you yell out and you don't have a microphone, you're wrong. So, Star Wars. Well, I love Star Wars, especially when it comes to very sciencey things, because unlike what Star Trek did, which is try to explain everything, Star Wars, at least in the movies, explains very, very little, which has its pros and cons, but it leaves up this grand gap for us to fill in what we think X and Y would do, or how a lightsaber might work, or what blasters do. And that's, that's kind of what all, all I do every day. For example, uh, why, do, why do TIE fighters make a sound in space? Yeah, what are midichlorians, I, you know, we don't have to get into that one. But is, is there a stormtrooper hype requirement? And why would there be one? They're clones, yes, but is there... This is for me. Um, say what you mean. So, uh, I think it's good because there is room to ask these questions and to geek out about stuff even more than we otherwise would when there are known answers to things that may or may not make sense. I really do think that we can learn from something like the Death Star or lightsabers um, in a fun way, without debunking it just trying to explain what we see. Now, I've already tried a lot of Star Wars topics um, from, you know, Kim Kylo Ren lift <coughs> Thor's hammer to Chewbacca and to lightsaber to, uh, and it cuts through the Wolverine, the lightsaber color and the 
breathe, he's breathing and there's also all the TIE Fighter and there's also all the lights. So, so, so I've done a lot uh, to try to tackle what I think is going on in the Star Wars universe. It's, a, it's fertile ground here. Um, a lot of topics. Some might say too many topics. Not me though. So for a presentation like this, I already have a lot of content that I'm familiar with. And I could just spend my time uh, here explaining how I think lightsabers might work, or um, what hyperspace might look like, which I already did, so I can't do now. But I think that if you're here, you're probably a real dyed-in-the-wool nerd, am I right? I, I'm assuming he's going to speak for all of you. Uh, so what I wanted to do with my time here today, I wanted to do something a little bit different than what I usually do, is that I'm coming here with three new topics that I've never talked about anywhere on anything, never written about it, never made a video about it. I will turn all these to they're these into videos, and but you'll get to hear about it first. How about that? Alright, let's do that. So keep in mind, maybe working the kinks out in some days. But uh, yeah, this is where the fun begins. I'll try sipping, that's a good trick. Oh come on, that's good! I thought of that on the fly. Okay, whatever. So, why do stormtroopers even wear armor? Why? It really does seem pointless. Off, of my, uh, off the top of my head, I cannot think of a single instance in which a stormtrooper has taken a direct hit and been fine. They always take one direct shot, there's a lot of smoke, non super penetrating wound here, and they go down dead like that. It's almost like, you know, you could hit them in the head with a rock if you were a small bear and they would also die. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like the Rebellion has weapons that the Empire does not. If a blaster is like a gun, and it's the, one of the most common weapons in the galaxy far, far away, then you'd expect stormtroopers to have armor that would deal with the most common weapon that they face. Um, and that would be blasters. Now, I think that Stormtrooper armor actually does function in the right way. Just really not greatly. Just bad. And let me, let me be more specific. So, what is the armor supposed to be blocking? It is a blaster, blaster fire. Now, whether blasters are plasma weapons, nerds, or laser weapons, I think is up for debate. You don't have to answer if you don't. No, but who, who thinks they're plasma weapons? The cannon says they're plasma weapons. Who thinks they're more laser-ish? Yeah, see, it's, it's, it's divided, right? Because there is no... The, the cannon has an explanation, but because there are so um, many gaps in the explanation of the science and technology of Star Wars, we can kind of have our own interpretations of it, and that's where the education comes in, I think. So, there are problems on both sides. First and foremost, if this is a laser weapon, we wouldn't be able to see them move down the hallway of the prison prison hallway, whatever it's called officially. You wouldn't be able to see the, beam, the beams themselves moving because they are moving as fast as anything can move at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. And if anyone was ever in your sights for a laser weapon and you pulled the trigger, they cannot die. Nothing can. If you, were, if you could see them, they were close. Plasma weapons, if they are plasma weapons, have even more problems, I think. So plasma is the fourth state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma. And what plasma basically is, is a gas, but you heat it up so hot that the atoms and electrons themselves separate and become kind of a commingled atom and electron soup that can conduct electricity and be confined by magnetic fields, something like that. But because it is so hot, it is under a lot of pressure. The atoms want to move a lot. That's what gives them the temperature. So if you fire a bolt of plasma from the end of a blaster, it would, unless it was confined some way by some magic, or the force maybe, once the plasma left the blaster, it would kind of come out just kind of like a fart. Just like, and it would be, it would be gone. Think about it, you have an intensely hot gas. This is, like, this is hotter than steam, for example much, 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 much hotter than steam. Coming out of this thing, and once it, if you try to shoot steam out of this, what do you think would happen? It would immediately 
really try to equalize his own pressure and become harmless very quickly. That's why you can steam a shirt and not also burn your face off. Because it dissipates, it doesn't just become a bee. And a uh, plasma blob, even if it was confined, would be lighter than the atmosphere probably, so it would float upwards and you'd have to shoot like, like these cool, you know, I think I'm, I'm digressing. So I think laser weapons are, uh, blasters are laser weapons. Thank you very much for your email. We're going to go that way. Because, don't ask you, um, even though the beams move too slow, I think it, it explains closer to what they actually do on film. So, if that's the case, then Stormtrooper armor has to protect against a quick pulse of energy. Energy in the form of radiation in the visible spectrum. That's what laser light is. Now, if the armor is supposed to block some quick pulse of radiation, like a laser pulse, then the armor would have to be designed differently than what we are usually used to here on Earth. This is what we are used to here on Earth. They never die. This is body armor. It's made from Kevlar. And what Kevlar does is spreads out the pressure of a bullet. That's all it's doing. So pressure is force divided by area. Don't worry, this won't be on the test. It will be on the test, just kidding. Uh, pressure is force divided by area. So when a bullet comes in with some force of impact behind it, the Kevlar strands have an incredible tensile strength, meaning that you can pull them very, very hard, and they will not break. It's one of the highest tensile strengths that we know of. So what it does, it comes in, hits the Kevlar, tries to stretch the Kevlar, the Kevlar stretches but does not break, and as it stretches, it increases the area over which the force is distributed. As, as, as you can see, if you have the same force, if you increase the area, you get a smaller pressure. That's how bullets penetrate things. They put all of that force behind the pressure, uh, behind the area of the bullet tip, and that's a lot of pressure. It just so happens to be more pressure than human skin can take. That's what a Kevlar vest does by spreading that out, lowering the pressure. But, of course, there's still enough force to crack ribs and cause major bruising. But, when we're talking about force of impact and the area over which it's spreading, Force is equal to how quickly, again, this is on the test, so pay attention. Uh, force is equal to how quickly something's momentum comes to a stop. Mass times velocity divided by time. It's F equals MA, if you're, if you're curious. You can separate it out like that. But a laser pulse, if it's a laser weapon, a blaster, <laughs> it goes very, very fast. The fastest, actually. <laughs> but light weighs literally nothing. So, although, although it has no mass, light has some momentum. That is a whole, that, that's a whole different course. I'm not going to get into it. But light, even though it has no mass, has some momentum, relativistically speaking. You can go read more about it later. I don't have time. So, the force of impact of something like a laser weapon you got shot, classic sci-fi with laser weapon. Pew, pew, pew. The force is going to be very, very small. So you do not need the same kind of area distribution that something like a Kevlar vest would do. So how would the armor be designed differently? How might it make sense? This is why I think Stormtrooper armor might make sense, even though the creators of the armor didn't consider any of this. <laughs> I found a laser thing and I just put it in everything. You're going to be seeing that laser a lot. So, un uh, unlike, unlike, here, here's a word of the day for you. Unlike kinetic kill projectiles like bullets, it sounds okay. Unlike kinetic kill projectiles, uh, lasers penetrate targets not by pushing material out of the way, like a bullet does. It uses pressure to push material out of the way. It instead vaporizes material in the way. It's a and then it comes in again and vaporizes more. That's what a laser does. It is heating up a little patch of where the laser is hitting, so hot that the material, liquid or gas, turns to steam, or vapor or smoke, and then another laser pulse comes in and digs in a little bit further. That's why most high-powered lasers are pulsed lasers. It happens really, really, really fast, like nanosecond, or femtosecond, billions, trillions of a second. But most lasers are pulsed. So, the, 
problem, of course, being that it looks like blasters only have a single pulse, right? At one time, it's not, it's not this nanosecond level laser. And it looks like they only vaporize a thin layer of material on a target. So that's what a laser does. It's only a few millimeters. Even high-powered lasers are only a few millimeters at a time. Because it's not like it doesn't carry that momentum that a bullet has. And you can see this by the creation of, again, they didn't consider any of this, they just happened to be right. The creation of a lot of smoke, meaning that there's a lot of material being vaporized here. You also do not see a deep wound, nor do you see an exit wound. On film, you always just kind of see a surface wound, right? You can see the glowing embers of what I'm assuming is their skin, or their clothes. But you're not seeing something that looks like a bullet. You're seeing something very, very surface level. So if you see where I'm going with this, I think this is why Stormtrooper armor might, pew, might make, surprise pew, uh, might make sense. So imagine, imagine that you're the Empire for a second. They did nothing wrong. Imagine that you're the Empire for a second, and you need to outfit millions, probably, of soldiers in some kind of armor to protect against laser weaponry. You need something that is light, something that is cheap, something that is effective against the most common weapon, which are blasters. But think about it. So you're Palpatine, and your soldiers are facing, are facing off against laser weapons that only have a single pulse and only vaporize a thin layer of material because of however powerful they are. That's why they need to shoot more than once, I guess. You do not need the bulky armor that you would need to block a bullet, then. So having a thin layer of plastic, if it is durable, makes sense. The plastic armor also is not in direct contact with the body, right? It's not on there anymore. It's over a body glove. As if, if anyone's a cosplayer in here, you know that a Stormtrooper outfit is a black body glove and then plastic armor that goes, kind of sits above it, kind of resting outside of the body glove. And that is good. Because with the armor being separated, not directly touching your skin, you are separating layers through which heat could transfer. You don't want that, because then you have, you know, like your glowing, burning chest. Also, if the layers are separated, you don't have the same explosive shockwave that will look a fine or don't worry. Um. <laughs> and the material itself vaporizes. It becomes that big puff of smoke. That's good. Looks like it's bad. That's good. Because... Thank you. Uh, because, light, uh, because lasers are light-based, obviously, they have a really hard time getting through opaque material, like smoke. Having armor that vaporizes so spectacularly uh, helps prevent against material heating as well, because the next incoming laser pulse or blaster bolt would have to make it through the smoke. I'm not, I'm not just making this up. We do use armor that vaporizes on purpose to protect against heating. It's called a blade of shielding. And it vaporizes itself on purpose to create a layer of smoke and gas and air through which it's harder for additional energy to travel. We use it on, you know, stuff like the Apollo command module. This is tried and tested and true stuff. The material on the bottom of this, the heat shielding on the bottom of the Apollo module here, gets so hot that it vaporizes but that smoke creates an additional layer through which it's harder for heat to go. Therefore not cooking any astronauts. Which is good. So I think then, considering all of that, that Stormtrooper armor is a decent enough compromise for its requirements. I think Stormtrooper armor maybe doesn't seem to do as much as it could be doing because maybe like a lack of vision or, or resources or something because laser armor could look something like what stormtroopers wear, considering what they are facing down. And maybe it's just an economic compromise from having to outfit millions of soldiers. Which kind of makes sense. We do it to our own military. Not to bring it down. We do do that, though. Hey, anyway. So, how about something a bit more technical? Yay! Woo! It's the first time that's ever gotten it. <laughs> technical! 
would an X-wing have? Oh, just wait, buddy. <laughs> So, hey, it's not, it's not talk back time. So, what's keeping us out of space and out of, out of dog fighting like a starfighter isn't really the ship design. It's not, it's not being able to create a, a shape like this. We can do that. It's not really the weapon systems. We can do that too. We have guns, we have lasers, we can do that. What it really is, is the propulsion systems. Having something that is small enough and powerful enough and looks right such that you could outfit a lot of small starfighters with it. None of, nothing that we have right now comes close to this, but if we had the means, what would we build this out of? I think there's an answer to that. So we want something that looks right, small enough, outfit small starfighters, something that has the thrust that we need, because although in space, mass isn't as much of a problem. If you want to move mass quickly, give it some momentum, it takes a lot of force. Hey, remember that equation that we went, went through earlier? Um, the T-65 model of X-Wing actually weighs 10 tons. So that's a lot. So if you want to move that around quickly, you're going to need a lot of thrust. And it's going to have to be the correct size, because it is small and has to be right behind your face. So. Let's start with the obvious choices then. Chemical rockets, like you'd find in the Saturn V or the soon-to-launch Falcon Heavy. These giants, these chemical rockets, definitely have the thrust that we need to move our mass around quickly. One engine on the Saturn V has 1.5 million pounds of thrust. It's a, it's a, it's a gargantuan amount of force. Um, but because their fuel is chemical-based, and chemicals can only provide so much energy for so much volume, you know, say a liter of gasoline only has so much energy in it, which is a chemical fuel, the rockets themselves have to be around 90% fuel by mass. Almost all of this, the screen is sticking, almost all of this is fuel. Up to, like, here. This is where people are. Just, just this, and the rest is fuel. So, these are obviously much larger than we want. This is, this, this is a size comparison with the X-Wing. That's how long an X-Wing is in comparison. You can see that the size difference, because of the fuel requirement, is a bit different? A little bit. And I think you can tell that even though the thrust is right, this doesn't look right. It's not the mountain of smoke and fire, although it is pretty awesome. So how about something a little bit more space-age that someone um, shouted out? Uh, so, don't shout it out, but does anyone know what the TIE in TIE Fighter stands for? Anyone? Let's go, no, you already said something. What about you? Way back. Twin Ion Engine. Exactly. TIE Fighter stands for Twin Ion Engine. And Ion Engine, what's really cool is that Ion Engines are a real thing, and they really look right. That's real. We use that in the lab and we've used it in space. That's perfect. Looks totally right. Very space age is what we're looking for. But these are supposed to be the thrusters that TIE fighters use, and it's supposed to be canonically what X rays use. But do they fit our criteria really? Well, ion engines certainly aren't that big. I've seen ones that are in labs, that are small enough to fit on like a large desk. So they definitely can be scaled down. But the problem that comes with that is that, oh, look at the little thrust. Just a tiny, just a tiny bit of thrust. Um, their thrust is minuscule. I spoke to a rocket scientist about this. I could do this for an hour and be fine give you some idea of the heat and the thrust coming out of this thing, you could hold your hand behind a good ion engine for an hour and it'd feel like you're touching a warm surface. That's about it. That is because ion engines work by taking small charged particles, ions, and using electric fields, which they, which they respond to, to fling them out the back, fling them out the back of the rocket, which provides thrust. 
But because we're talking about individual particles here, like atoms, just atoms, they have very, very low mass. And even though they come screaming out of this thing very fast because they don't have a lot of mass, it's not a lot of thrust. That's the problem. So when we use real ion engines in space, they are great because they can be scaled down, they're small, and they're also incredibly fuel efficient. 99% of the fuel goes directly to thrust, which you do not get on any other rocket. And they can build up enormous speeds. Like the fastest man-made object in the universe has ion engines currently on it. But that's because ion engines have to accelerate for literally years before they reach a top speed. Because their thrust is so low, the math works out because they're efficient, so you can do this, but they have to accelerate for years before they get up to anything fast, or months, or days, or weeks. On any time scale, that is not quick enough for a starfighter. And these things do not weigh the same. I don't know how much that weighs. Probably about the same as that guy. We're talking about 10 metric ton tons in an X-ray, so if you have a tiny bit of thrust, it takes years to accelerate, uh, not gonna work. By the way, this is CERT-1. It was an uh, ion engine test, uh, test craft, and it has two, count them, two ion engines, which makes it a TIE fighter. <laughs> Technically. I don't know why NASA doesn't publicize that. We have TIE fighters, come work for us. Done. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> right now, the Dawn mission um, uses ion engines. It's flying around space. It has three ion engines. It's a tri-fighter. Still works. The T acronyms, look it up. That's how acronyms work. Still works. So how about something else? Something a bit more... Around 1958, we started looking at a new kind of spacecraft engine. One that utilized what we were trying to harness at the time, which is awesome and destructive nuclear power, nuclear explosions. So, so-called Project Orion <coughs> wanted to use nuclear explosions as thrust. Literally. More specifically, what they wanted to do was perfectly time throwing nuclear bombs out from behind a spacecraft and then have the spacecraft ride the explosions and the shockwaves into space for thrust. Pretty, pretty freaking cool. Seriously, we have designs for these. You can see, it's, this isn't that much longer than a, a uh, X-Wing in general, so the size is right. But here, here's you, here's the crew module, here's a nuclear explosion, <laughs> right here. About 20 meters away, so less than a football field, way less than a football field. Like, from me to the back of this room, maybe. It's like, okay, I can imagine, I can imagine the pitch. Like, okay, Johnson, you're gonna be here, and then at the back of that room is gonna be a nuclear bomb, and you're gonna write. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. Nonsense, we did some of the math. <laughs> now, ultimately, designs on uh, so-called nuclear, pul nuclear pulse engines were uh, terminated because they were worried about the whole potential for nuclear radioactive fallout everywhere and other life-ending things and bad stuff. But in theory, a rocket like this, using dozens of nuclear bombs for fuel, which again sounds terrible, don't worry, you're going to have 80 nuclear bombs on board and you're going to ride them all to space. <laughs> Alright, sign me up. But because you're using nuclear explosions as thrust, it is an incredible amount of thrust. In theory, this design could get us, some of us, a, a small crew, to the closest star, Alpha Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away, in a single human lifetime. And if you know anything about how big space is, that's incredible. These things could accelerate you up to 1% the speed of light, which is, it sound, the percentage sounds low, but it is crazy fast. But this doesn't look right, does it? No. You don't see nuclear bombs flinging out of the back of all starfighters, and it'd be very hard to maneuver something like that. 
you'd have to move the ship first and then throw a bomb out and then go and then then rotate and then go again. It'd be really it'd be the hardest game of asteroids, I think. <laughs> so what about what about the really exciting stuff? The stuff that rocket scientists dream about and the stuff that science fiction writers so often uh, rely on. Talking about and you Star Trek nerds will know this, but nuclear fusion engines for one and antimatter engines for two. Now, fusion is the process of forcing two particles so close together, overcoming the forces that repel them, very strong forces, forcing them so close together, with so much heat, that they fuse and form a new particle. But in that process, some of the mass is lost and created and uh, converted directly into energy according to E equals mc squared. It's a lot of energy. But, although we can do this, we haven't been able to get more energy out of one of these things than we've put in so far. It's hard to capture all that heat, and the reactor sometimes melts. And that's bad. And the neutrons eat away at your bones. You know, we don't have to keep doing that. So, a rocket that uses nuclear fusion, sorry, this is a little small. A rocket that uses nuclear fusion is pretty straightforward. You have the same setup as a fusion reactor. You have plasma confined by magnetic fields. You heat it up so hot that it fuses, and then all the energy that comes from that fusion is thrown out the back as thrust. Very simple. Or you can take something like hydrogen, pipe it into the back, heat the hydrogen up, spray it out. Very, very simple. And it looks right. It is a nice bluish glow. Very futuristic. The engine also could, in theory, scale down. We're working on that now, scaling down nuclear fusion reactors. And they provide the serious thrust, and they look right. And this is all rocket science is. They don't tell you that in non-rocket science school, because rocket scientists want to sound all smart all the time. But all it is is just figuring out really good ways of throwing stuff in the other direction. That's it. That's all rocket science is. It just gets more complicated from there. But if we have a technology, if we have the technology to make nuclear fusion engines work, maybe we also have the wherewithal, as humanity might in whenever Star Trek takes place. Twenty. I. Nerds? Anyone? I forget. It depends on the series. You're right. So, we might be able to create antimatter engines instead, and this uses the most efficient fuel known to science. Antimatter. So if you are in the previous, uh, when we were just talking, antimatter, particle, same particle and opposite charge, they come together, and they release energy according to their mass, e equals mc squared. And it is a lot. It is a hundred times more energy they can get from fusion, I think a billion times more than you can get from the same amount of chemical fuel. It is a lot. Now I want to give you an idea of how, just how efficient antimatter is in producing energy. Everyone, hold out your hand like this. Everyone. Okay. Now imagine you're holding like an M&M &M between your thumb and forefinger, tiny piece of candy. In theory, that, the amount of antimatter that can fit between your thumb and forefinger right now, is enough to give you the thrust to get you to Mars. Now, it's, it, it is an incredible amount of potential. In just a small amount of material, you get an enormous amount of energy, and that is why designs like this are so seductive, especially to Star Trek, because you can have very little material, meaning that you don't have to carry a lot, meaning the engines can be smaller. Very little material creates a mountain of energy. Literally, um, we don't have to get into it. So, you combine the antimatter, you throw it out the back with magnets. Easy. Rocket science. Or you pump in some gas, heat up the gas, throw it out the back. Easy. So, antimatter has the thrust. It could scale down, because you just need the chamber to react these things in. Although you'd have to keep them separated perfectly. You know, like the Da Vinci Code totally figured out? <laughs> um, and it also has the look, because it's, it's creating the same kinds of products in its exhaust. Very futuristic. So, where does that leave us? That's all the engines I'm going to consider. There's also a black hole engine, but that's weird. <laughs> they are really cool. Look them up. Uh, we can go back to a handy dandy chart. <laughs> I did the Foley work in episode three. Um, <laughs> so, as you can see, everything we've gone, everything we've gone through, chemical rockets, Thrust, doesn't look right, too big. 
on engines. Good, good. Tiny thrust. Pulse. Die from nuclear bombs. Fusion and antimatter pretty much check all the boxes. And if we wanted to build something that was small, powerful, capable, it would probably be one of these technologies. And whatever one that's going to be, it's going to be whatever is the easier breakthrough. Right now, antimatter, if you had to create it in mass, costs something around, if you were operating a a large particle accelerator, for example, something around $62 trillion per gram to make. Ugh, not exactly like SpaceX level reduction of cost here. Um, and we're not close to fusion yet, but whatever one happens first, that's going to be on a Starfire. Mark my words. Unless it's too far in the future. So, I call this approach to what I do, this kind of thing, because science, because I found myself as a nerd always using this argument. Why is, why is something the way it is? Because science, you know, the Hulk is green because he's one big bruise. Because science, dang it. Or Wolverine could get a tattoo. He could. I'm not gonna tell you why, watch the video. Because science. <laughs> but I stuck with this approach because I think this is like a gateway drug to learning more and more about everything. When you understand that this kind of nerdy thinking is based upon a set of principles that applies to not just science fiction, but the universe. I think it's a great way to extend your fascination into other walks of life. And it gets, you know, it's, it's exciting to me because I hear a lot from parents and teachers, and especially uh, younger kids. My videos tend to skew like 13 to 24, prime decision-making time in your life. And I think that's because people really respond to this. The, uh, I find that if, if you if you add to people's passions rather than subtracting from them, and you bend the universe a little bit, but you don't break it, it's a lot more fun. No one, uh, if I came up here and I said, X-wings aren't possible, blasters are stupid, what would be the fun of that? It's no fun, and we're not learning it. So what do you think? You, like, you guys like getting nerdy like that? Let's do one more. Okay, let's do one more. And I'm really excited to eventually make this video that I'm about to kind of outline for you. Because I'm going to ruin the lightsabers, kind of, for you. But in a cool way. No, no, no. Just wait. I'm not going to say they, they're not possible. I'm just going to say they might be a little messy. So death by lightsaber is so much worse than the movie show. So if you've ever seen a hand come off or someone, you know, Qui-Gon Jinn, whatever. There are emotional moments, sure, but I think if we really consider what would happen if you took a lightsaber to the arm or the chest or the face, something terrible would happen. And this is just a consequence of the physics that it says. Don't worry, it'll be, it'll be funner. This is right. So first, what is a lightsaber? Well, the most common uh, explanation, one that is technically canon, is that there's a magnetic field that comes out in a ring from the hilt, and in that field is confined hot, hot, hot plasma, like we just went through. And the way that a lightsaber makes it through something is by bringing this plasma that's very hot into contact with other objects, and those objects get so hot that parts of them vaporize and move out of the way as smoke, and then the lightsaber can continue through. So here's where it gets a little weird. If a lightsaber is putting out enough power to make it hilt deep, oh man, that is dark. Hey, that's why you have in there. And that is the lightsaber in the blast in the prequels. Oh, yes! Visual aids. Perfect. Okay, so. Oh, it's even better than I thought. So this is Qui Gon Jinn. Qui Gon Jinn, prequels. Easily slashing through a blast door and then goes hilt deep into the blast door in a, in a single second. You can time it up. And think. Think about that. If you can do that to something that's stronger than steel, probably, in a second, what would it really do to your skin? Yeah, don't worry, I'll go through it. <laughs> I calculated that in this scene, in if, if it's something like steel and it goes in in a second and it's about yay big, inside this hilt is about the same amount of power that a nuclear submarine's engine puts out. <laughs> like like 35 megawatts of power, a 
stupid amount of power to have in your hand. <laughs> Actually scary amount of power, which I will get to. So, what is the lightsaber doing? It is vaporizing material. That means it's heating up materials so much that when it comes into contact with them, they turn into vapor or smoke. They, the material turns into a gas, changes phase. Technically speaking, then, it is either vaporizing, which is turning from a liquid into a gas through boiling or evaporation, or it is sublimating, going through sublimation, which is just turning from a solid into a gas, like dry ice is. If this is what the lightsaber does, though, and how it cuts the material, let's, let's think about what if that material was you. You may understand where I'm going with this, but the human body is mostly water. I'll point out it's not like this. It's not, it's not water from the shoulders down. That would be weird. And you'd walk, because you'd slosh, and you'd walk weird like this. It'd be, it'd be very weird. But you have, you, have, you have water in pretty much every fiber of your being. And there's some non-water stuff, like proteins that make your bones, and, and your hair, and stuff like that. But the human body is mostly water, and being mostly water, when a lightsaber encounters your body, your body is going to undergo some form of vaporization by boiling or sublimation. So water has a boiling point, and if you bring it up slowly to that boiling point, like say you make your pasta on the stove, a little bubble, nice, you can deal with it, some steam. But if you rapidly turn water into steam, which is what vaporizing is, you rapidly turn something from whatever phase it's in into gas, which a lightsaber would have to do if it was passing through something quickly, you have suddenly a lot of mass turning into a lot, increasing in volume a lot, because gases want to fill the space that they're in. So for example, watch what happens when some dummy in some factory throws a water bottle full of water, like, just like this, into a vat of molten metal. Same, it's the same, this is the same phenomenon. This is, this is what happens when a lot of water vaporizes all at once. So, water bottle here, boop, poof, almost instantaneously throwing out a lot of material. And all that is happening here is the molten metal is heating up the water so quickly that it flashes into steam in an instant. And all that steam tries to push other stuff out of the way. That is pushing the metal out of its way. Do you now see where I'm going? <laughs> so, if a lightsaber is pumping out enough energy to do all the things that we see this elegant weapon do, then this is what would happen. Does anyone want to come come up stage and help me out with something? Come on, let's go up. Everyone, give him a hand. He's about to die. All right, right up here. What was your name again? Chris. Nice to meet you, Chris. You're about to die horribly, but it's in the service of science. So. Space towards the crowd. We're going to demonstrate something. So here's my lightsaber. I turn it on, and everyone in the room catches on fire. But let's ignore that for a minute. <laughs> let's just ignore that for a second. Okay. So, so here's my lightsaber. I take a swing right here, right about here, about four inches or ten centimeters away. All of his clothes flash off. <laughs> Flat. Please, go ahead and no. <laughs> they, they flash off into cinders, and it's so hot that the skin on his body evaporates away and becomes a boiling cinder char of glowing orange flesh. I did the math. This, this all happens within a few milliseconds. And this is before I even touch him. So, please turn to the side. Thank you so much. Don't worry. I'll be gentle. Now he's pierced. Now, oh, he's more than dead. Uh, so I have a lightsaber that is so hot that it can vaporize bone and metal. It is now encased in his flesh. And if you do the math, about a kilogram of water would vaporize within the first second. All of that water has to turn, more water than that was in that gift that I showed you. 
All of that is turning into steam instantaneously, and with no place to go, aside from outside of the wound, That steam turns into gas that is moving at Mach 1. So the speed of sound, because it has no place else to go, it is moving out of the wound at Mach 1, there's no place else to go, and that happens in a few microseconds, which means it's an explosion of steam that was you. And then as that's happening, the steam blows you in half, and the steam pushes your body parts away, and then your clothes set on fire, and then any pieces of you that come back down also set on fire and also explode and call it. It's, it's really terrible. So if you want to go ahead and demonstrate that. <laughs> Help me out. <laughs> that was pretty good. Thank you so much. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Thanks. Whoa. He died good. So... This mean, this does indeed mean that every death by lightsaber, or injury by lightsaber that you've ever seen, is going to be so much worse if we extend the physics that we see not just to doors, not just to droids, but to people, which are the targets of the weapons, to flesh. So, Qui-Gon Jinn, he's going he's gonna to be like Qui-Gon after that. <laughs> same thing, same thing that I just demonstrated. He's going to kind of explode. Darth Maul, um, you wouldn't have to wonder if he got blown apart, or if he got cut in half, because he'd kind of just be just kind of forced apart, half by half. Uh, Kenobi, you know, you know, man, I don't, I don't care if you force ghost your way out of this situation, but his clothes are going to inferno. Django, oh, sorry, my man. Uh, so I didn't do the math on this, but based on everything that I just said, if you cut off some dude's head who's wearing a lot of armor and you vaporize the neck, and the head is still in a helmet, yeah, I think it makes a head rocket. I, I, think, I think if he hit it here, it's... And then his, and then his kid's right there, and I'm like, oh, no! It's so much worse. That's going to be in the remastered version of the movies. And I'm sorry to do this, but this is the longest a lightsaber has ever been in contact with anyone. Many, many dozens of seconds. And I won't reiterate what happens, but you can just imagine if you held something that was that hot inside of a person for that long. Oh. <laughs> this terribleness implies a few other things, too. I mean, the first... Thank you, I don't need this anymore. <laughs> That, can, that kind of thing can only happen here. Uh, lightsaber wounds, according to this kind of analysis, it means that the wounds aren't going to be nice and tidy. We assume, we've assumed for 40 years that they would cauterize everything, right? Just nice and easy, burnt, charred, easy. And you can just kind of like walk it off, get your hand cut off, and like, ah, Cloud City. But, like, ah, Cloud City. But what is cauterization? Cauterization is making a mess of your molecular machinery. You bring, you bring heat, something like a, a hot object, into contact with your skin, and it denatures or unravels all the proteins in your blood and in your tissue, and it dries out some of your tissue, and it basically creates a blockage through which blood can no longer flow. But, Although, movies like Rambo or The Revenant make this look very down and dirty and kind of easy to do, real cauterization when we use it in medicine is actually a very, very careful and deliberate use of heat and energy that takes time and that is, has certain heat requirements. It is a cautious use of a little bit of energy. This is not a cautious use of energy. This is, this is a nuclear submarine in your hand. <laughs> So, a lightsaber wound, it would not give your flesh, according to how cauterization happens, it would not give your flesh enough time to make a mess of itself. It would just... and make a bad wound even worse. Ugh, man. Now, I've considered lightsabers in the past to be like these fusion reactors I keep, I keep saying, and maybe this is why they don't burn your hands off when you turn them on. 
because there is only a few grams, like a few paper clips weight worth of plasma in there. And because they're confined by magnetic fields, just like if that was real and I was over here, I'd be fine. Seriously, I'd be fine. It goes from millions of degrees to room temperature in less than this space. I think it's the biggest temperature drop in the universe that we know of, which is very cool. But if a lightsaber is putting out megawatts worth of power because of what we see it do, then turning one on would be like hitting a death button in a room, where everyone in the room would suddenly feel as though they were standing next to the sun, the actual sun. Not gravity wise, but the surface of the sun hot. And I think if you, you can imagine that if I put the sun right here, I probably wouldn't be good. You definitely are not. You might be okay. Probably not. But it's not gonna be it's not gonna be a good thing. But as you can see, the, the essence of this kind of science and pop culture analysis, putting them together, comes down to really what we're willing to accept what we want to be in the canon, what we don't want to be, what we're going to consider as a true example, what we're not going to consider. And all that's fine. You can consider it to be just a few grams of plasma and you can hold it out in your hand this far, and you're fine. But if you also want to, if you want to consider it as being able to go through a door like butter, it's probably going to explode somebody, which I also argue is pretty cool. <laughs> but that's up to you. That's the fun of these kind of situations. So, Analyzing pop culture like this obviously isn't as rigorous as a science class, but I hope and I think it can get at least some people interested in taking something like a science class or learning more. All these topics are really silly, but we're already fascinated by them, so it's very easy to extend that fascination out into other forms of inquiry. And look, we just spent a little bit of our afternoon talking about imaginary armor and antimatter engines and exploding Han Solos, but, you know, all I can ask is that I hope it was at least entertaining, and, you know, if you happen to learn something, or you wanted to learn more, or get interested in plasma physics or something, that is all I can do and all I can ask for. So, uh, thank you so much.